This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news recorded at 14 hours GMT on Wednesday the 10th of January. I'm Alex Ritson with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, 5,000 people on death row in Iran for drug offences may be spared the noose. The vast majority, one would believe, of those who are currently on death row would be exonerated, and this is being done retrospectively. Also in the podcast, the UN says more than 100,000 Syrians have been displaced by a government offensive in Idlib, the last province still in rebel hands. A mudslide in one of California's most exclusive areas has left 13 people dead. It looked like a World War I battlefield. Rocks, downed trees, power lines, wrecked cars, lots of obstacles. And later, the lows of one of the kings of rock and roll. Towards the end of my drinking, I thought about suicide all the time. My mum, I was raised to think, was my sister. And my uncle was my brother. But first, the head of the judiciary in Iran has ordered all judges in the country to halt death sentences for anyone convicted of drug offences. Iranian media said that Ayatollah Sadegh Lajani called on the judges to review the cases of some 5,000 people in line with new measures that were approved by the Iranian parliament last year. Iran has an execution rate second only to China, according to Amnesty International, and most of her drug trafficking. I asked our Arab Affairs editor, Sebastian Asher, how far-reaching this change is and what prompted it. It's pretty far-reaching in that Amnesty International, you quoted there, has said that uh, in the past 20 or even 30 years now, more than 10,000 executions have taken place for drug trafficking. Now, the change is in the amount, essentially, that someone can receive the death penalty for being in possession of, which has been hugely increased. So that means that a vast majority, one would believe, of those who are currently on death row would be exonerated, and this is being done retrospectively. The head of a judiciary has said this could affect some 5,000 people uh, in their cases. He's ordered judges not only not to carry out any death sentences, which we believe haven't been carried out since these new measures were introduced last year, but uh, he's also said that the cases must be reviewed. But it may be harder for those on death row of limited financial means. That and also, you know, the influence they have, the education they have in being able to understand this and what they can do. A leading Iranian human rights campaigner welcomed the move, but this is the problem that he raised, saying that he believed that since most of these people are from marginalised sections of society, they may not be able to take advantage of the change. Is this a sign that Iran is trying to change its image? I think there's a lot of pressure inside Iran for this change to be made. It's true that it doesn't particularly want to be seen as one of the main countries' current executions in the world, and there's, under, there's some international pressure over that. But I think there's been a big move inside Iran over this, from the parliament itself, from its MPs, but this just isn't the correct way to deal with the drug problem. United Nations officials say about 100,000 Syrians have fled areas in the northwestern province of Idlib since December, when the Syrian government started a major new offensive. Idlib is the last Syrian province under rebel control. Meanwhile, the Turkish foreign minister told Russia and Iran that they must do more to prevent the Syrian army mounting attacks in the area, which they've defined as a de-escalation zone. I asked our diplomatic correspondent Jonathan Marcus whether this could be the start of a rift between Turkey, Russia and Iran. There are clearly tensions. Uh, the Turks calling in both the uh, Iranian and Russian ambassadors to forcefully put their point of view. They were, of course, always strange bedfellows from the outset in the sense that Turkey had always uh, opposed the Assad regime and had uh, uh, practically backed opposition groups in an effort to uh, see that regime overthrown. Russia, of course, and Iran were the two great uh, staunch uh, allies of uh, the Syrian president Assad. But of course, when it became clear that uh, the uh, Assad regime was not going to go in the short term and that Russian and Iranian military assistance had basically consolidated, saved its position, the Turks had something of a rethink. 
Turkey's principal interest is in uh, protecting its own borders and ensuring that uh, uh, any Kurdish uh, influences on the other side of the border don't lead to an autonomous Kurdish area uh, on its own territory. And so it saw, for the time being certainly, as trying to join in this process with uh, Tehran and Moscow as the best means forward. Whether that ultimately is going to be the case now clearly is thrown into question by these tensions. As you say... Russia, a key military ally for President Bashar al-Assad, and yet hosting a peace conference. What is it that Moscow actually wants? Well, having, if you like, proved that it could decisively intervene militarily in Syria, Russia now wants to extract some kind of a diplomatic benefit as well. Uh, so it sees itself uh, as one of the key uh, elements in brokering uh, that kind of deal. It's probably not terribly happy at the moment that the uh, Assad government is uh, continuing its offensive in this way. But uh, clearly there are uh, probably some differences there. But I think uh, the Russians uh, want to be able to come out of this both being able to say they, that they consolidated uh, the Syrian regime and restored stability, but also that they uh, helped achieve a lasting uh, settlement. And that, I think, is what Russia's diplomatic goal is at the moment. In just a few seconds, is there any real chance of peace? In the short term, probably no, but uh, the fact remains, uh, whether people like it or not, that the Assad regime is now a fixture in Syria uh, and everybody is going to have to recalibrate their position and try to bring some you know, much-needed relief and assistance to the country based on that fact. If they can't do that, then clearly the immediate and uh, medium-term future of the country is, uh, is very uncertain. Jonathan Marcus. They say that in war, truth is the first casualty. It is as true in Yemen's bloody conflict as anywhere. Last month, a prison in the capital, Sana'a, was bombed, destroyed by a Saudi warplane. Inside were hundreds of their own men captured by Houthi rebels, along with journalists, political prisoners and even children. Dozens died. How and why did it happen? Was it an escape plan gone wrong, the targeting of an arms depot, or something more cynical? The BBC's Nawal al Magafi reports. <laughs> As you approach what remains of the El Shaoub military police camp, the first thing you see are the thick concrete walls with great holes blown into them. I'm being shown around by Ali Naji, a Houthi prison guard who was here as the bombs fell. The first airstrike hit there in the yard. The second one fell on the roof, on the guard's room. The third one was dropped here. Scattered amongst the broken rubble are reminders of the prisoners who escaped just a few days before and those who failed to make it. We follow a bloody trail of clothes, shoes, bags and body parts into the center of the facility. Around 180 people were being held here by the Houthi rebels. Many of them were fighters supporting the government. But there were also journalists that were hostile to the Houthis, as well as political prisoners. One of the guards tells us there was even a room that was full of children. The UN says 45 people died that night, 53 more were injured. Ali Naji, the Houthi guard, tells me the prisoners were trying to escape and that the airstrikes seemed to follow them as they ran away. The Yemeni government, backed by Saudi Arabia, have complete air superiority. It's widely accepted they dropped the bombs that flattened this facility and killed the men inside. The real question is, why did they carry out an attack that resulted in the deaths of so many of their own side? In the aftermath, the government news channel said the military camp was being used as an arms depot and that the men inside were being held as human shields by the Houthis. But as we walk through the wreckage of the site just 24 hours after the bombs fell, there is no sign of any weapons. Bodies have not yet been cleared up. It seems unlikely an entire arms depot could have been moved. We travel to the local hospital where the injured were taken. There, under the watchful eyes of the Houthi minders, 
I meet two of the prisoners who were there that night. They have a very different theory, that it was an attempt to free them gone horribly wrong. I was asleep and then suddenly I heard an airstrike. Then the second hit and we were terrified. We woke up and there was a third. It opened the gates and we all started running. Then the fourth one hit. I passed out. And I don't know what happened next. The Houthis took me to the hospital. I asked the second prisoner what happened to him. Some of us were climbing the gates. Then another strike hit. Some people were hurt. There were seven strikes. I was hit with the seventh. This is what happened. He points to the tube still draining blood from a wound to his chest. I asked the first prisoner what he thinks the airstrikes were trying to achieve. I think they were trying to kill us all. I've been in prison for two years and no one has ever tried to get me out. As remarkable as it sounds, it is a theory their Houthi captors agree with. It's rumored that the men in the prison were about to be part of a prisoner exchange and that the Saudis didn't want it to happen. Back at the prison, Ali Naji tells me the attack was their way of stopping it. The parents of the men who died are furious. They say their sons went to fight for the government. They got imprisoned because of the government, and then the government ordered the attack that ended up killing them as well. But it wasn't just government fighters who were imprisoned at Al Shaoub. Amina fears her teenage son, who was a student, was being held there. And she's still waiting for news of his fate. The last time I saw him was four months after he was imprisoned. It was horrible. He was so thin and weak. But when I asked him how he was doing, he said he was fine, or at least he would be okay. <laughs> I hope I will see him released one day and that I get to hold my son again. There's no hope. We don't know if we will ever see him again. <laughs> the Saudis have never officially addressed the reason for the attack. Nearly 50 people died that day in the El Shaoub military facility. Many of them, like Amina's son, said to be ordinary civilians. How they died is clear. Why may remain a mystery. That report by Noel al Magafi. China has lodged a formal diplomatic protest with Australia over comments made by its Minister for International Development. Conchetta Fieravanti Wells accused Beijing of funding what she called white elephant infrastructure projects across the South Pacific. From Australia, Phil Mercer reports. Roads to nowhere and useless buildings are part of China's checkbook diplomacy in Australia's backyard, according to Conchetta Fieravanti Wells. The International Development Minister is worried about China's growing presence in the South Pacific. Fiji has been moving closer to the Chinese in recent years, and Papua New Guinea has signed a series of deals as part of Beijing's Belt and Road Global Trade Initiative. Opposition MPs say Australia's cuts to its regional aid budget have allowed China to exert more influence. Almost four years ago, the Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 disappeared en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing with 239 people on board. Despite the largest search in aviation history, scouring 120,000 square kilometres of the Indian Ocean, the plane was never found. But a new deal signed by the Malaysian government means the search will resume. The Malaysian Transport Minister Liao Tiong Lai made the announcement. We have entered an official contract with uh, Ocean Infinity to locate MH370. Based on the agreement, Ocean Infinity will undertake search operation to locate flight MH370. Our Southeast Asia correspondent Jonathan Head told me more about the new search. The company that's offered this deal is a company called Ocean Infinity. They're based in Houston. It appears that they've been working with 
the technology they have, and, and they've got a, a fleet of up to eight mini submarines that they can deploy, they're autonomous, they don't have drivers, very deep in the ocean, and they've worked out a way in which they can cover a much larger area of the ocean in a shorter time. In other words, they're saying they could cover almost that area, something like 100,000 100, kilometres, in just three months, rather than the two and a half years it took the previous salvage operation. It isn't clear whether this capacity was available in the past or not, the company appears to have latched on to the abandonment of the search by the Malaysian government last year. That was very controversial. Family members insisted the search should go on, that there were still other areas that should be looked at. Well, this company has decided that the additional analysis of data, the very flimsy data we've got from the flight that's continued over the last year or so, has identified a new area to the north of where the original search took place. And they've done drift analysis of, of the bits of debris that have washed up on the East African coast and come up with this zone. And they've figured that there's a reasonable enough chance for the debris being found there, or the wreckage of the, of the plane, for them to make a, an offer where basically they say, if we find it, we get a big fee, but if we don't find it, you don't have to pay. Of course, that's going to lay the Malaysian government open to the charge that the reason they abandoned the search last year was because they didn't want to pay, and that has really outraged relatives. But I think the family members will be pleased that the search is being resumed, and everyone is quite hopeful that the technology this search team is deploying, combined with the new data and the possibility of this new zone be more more optimistic might actually deliver a result. Is yes, the company is putting its money where its mouth is and very briefly essentially what they've got are submarines which are unmanned which can go far deeper than anything that's been used before and they have more of them. They do have more of them. They can go deeper. There's more to it than that. They've been doing a lot of practicing in the Atlantic. The way they deploy them and the efficiency with which they scan for bits of data and don't try and map the bottom. I think they have probably learnt a lot from the other salvage team and they probably will be able to be a lot more efficient. Jonathan Head. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in The World This Week and the programme is also available to download from our website www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. Now to the United States. It looked like a World War I battlefield. It was literally a carpet of mud and debris everywhere with huge boulders, rocks, downed trees, power lines, wrecked cars, lots of obstacles. That was Bill Brown, the county sheriff of Santa Barbara in Southern California, where at least 13 people have died in mudslides caused by a ferocious storm on Tuesday. Heidi Fennell, who lives in Burbank, near Los Angeles, said she saw cars being swept away in the water. These cars were parked on our street and they were picked up along with huge boulders, telephone poles, furniture, everyone's garbage cans, everything got picked up in the water and uh, flown down the street. For about a full hour it rushed. In the town of Montecito, where the TV star Oprah Winfrey lives, officials say around 300 people are trapped in their homes. Berkeley Johnson was rescued from his house after it was damaged by boulders. I was cleaning the drains and uh, I heard the rumble of the rocks and I looked over at the river and the trees were just coming down, choo, choo, choo. And we ran into the house and right then the, the boulders busted through our house and we got upstairs and it, it got up to uh, about eight feet, nine feet up the stairs and uh, we were able to crawl out a window to the roof. The house is wiped out, just took everything out. And then later uh, we were worried about a neighbor's house and I went over to see if uh, they were okay and we heard a, a little baby cry. And uh, finally came over and uh, we dug down and found a little baby. I don't know where it came from. We got it out, got the mud out of its mouth. I'm hoping it's okay they took it right to the hospital. But it was just a baby four feet down in the mud in nowhere under the rocks. But who knows what else is out there. Fabiola Ramirez is a local reporter with KSBY News. These mudslides and this big storm, this was something that was anticipated and people were warned to evacuate, but many people decided to stay. And when the rains came really strong, hit up on the hilltop and gushed down, taking everything on its way, whether it was ash, debris, tree logs, and in some cases even started moving homes. And the more it moved down, the more powerful it went. 
taking many, many homes, taking cars along with it. By the time that it got to the bottom of the hillside near the freeway and close to the ocean, there was just so much devastation. And in many cases, it even took people with it. They say at least 24 people are still missing and there are crews out there right now in the dark at night, still searching, still screaming, trying to see if there's anyone still alive or anyone that can be rescued. And in many cases, they have found people. In other cases, unfortunately, they found bodies, but no response. Fabiola Ramirez in Santa Barbara. Czechs go to the polls this weekend in the first round of the country's presidential election, very much a referendum on the incumbent Miloš Zaman. Analysts say President Zaman is a very divisive figure, inspiring admiration and hatred in equal measure. And while it's a largely ceremonial post, Czech presidents have long carved out a major role for themselves in the country's politics. Rob Cameron reports. Ladies and gentlemen, Every politician who speaks in the European Parliament expresses... To his supporters, Miloš Zeman is the last of the titans of Czech politics, a veteran leftist with a political career as long as his arm, fluent in Russian and English, erudite, witty and learned, yet still a man of simple pleasures, salami, spirits and lots of cigarettes. A politician who understands the hopes and fears of ordinary people. One of them in my cottage, um, to uh, his opponents, he's a political dinosaur, crude, vindictive, inward-looking, a populist and Islamophobe who's realigned himself with the far right, a man who openly admires authoritarian regimes such as Russia and China, a drunkard whose diabetes has made him physically incapable of carrying out his duties, a tiresome joker who's painfully unaware of his linguistic limitations. And more than that, my European dream does not include the stake in the centre of European Commission, which looks like a bubble bum and tastes like a bubble bum. So there were smirks and giggles that time, though some of his put-downs are intentionally funny. But was he joking when he said the one good thing about militant Islam was the ban on women driving? Or that burqas were wrong, but for some women he knew they could be an improvement? Or, meeting Vladimir Putin, that there are too many journalists and they should be liquidated? No wonder there are eight men lined up to challenge him. Here at Tip Sports, the country's largest betting agency, the wagers are coming in thick and fast, and Mr. Zeman is the odds-on favourite. Gone are the days of men in raincoats filling out betting slips in smoke-filled rooms. Today, 95% of Tip Sports bets are placed online. Václav Sokor is the company's head of public relations. Political betting is risky for us. We have no special software for this and the bookmakers, they have to study deeply. The more people are uh, putting their money on, on Mr. Zeman, for example, or on the contra candidate, they are influencing our odds. And as we can see, the odds that betting companies have are usually much more precise than opinion polls. And those odds predict Mr. Zeman will easily make it through to the second round to face either Jerzy Drahoš, former head of the Czech Academy of Sciences, or Michal Horáček, a music producer and, coincidentally, the co-founder of one of Tip Sport's main rivals. Both men are centrists, keen to return a sense of decorum to the presidency and reaffirm the country's Western orientation. For Clara Negrinova, a student at a secondary school in the suburbs, it's an exciting and important occasion. I'm 17 years old and I'm turning 18 on the second day of election. And this is going to be my first time voting, so I'm very excited. It's going to be a great experience. Clara goes to the polls at a strangely rootless time for her country, when traditional politics is fracturing, when labels such as left and right are increasingly meaningless. Milos Zeman is betting on the voters' desire for stability, experience, a steady hand. His opponents say his time in office has been anything but, 
Mr Zeman has loosened the bonds, they say, that have made the Czech Republic a stable and prosperous European democracy. It's time, they say, to take a gamble on change. That report by Rob Cameron. The huge asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago is the best-known extinction event in the history of the Earth, but it wasn't the most devastating. Nearly 200 million years earlier, there was another event, often referred to as the Great Dying, when most of the Earth's species died out. As for the remaining species, surprisingly little is known about what they did next and how they survived. A new study from the University of Bristol here in the UK looks at those questions. Mike Benton is one of the researchers. The fascinating thing about this extinction event was it wasn't caused by an asteroid, which, which is pretty certainly the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs, but by volcanic activity and climate change. And so it sounds a much more benign set of crises, if you, if you can have benign crises, and yet the impact was much greater. Our science correspondent Helen Briggs told me more. This event, the Great Dying, was the Earth's most severe extinction event. So up to 96% of marine animals died out, 70% of land animals were wiped out. Massive volcanoes were belching out thousands of tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, setting off this chain of events, global warming, acid rain, oceans warmed up. Uh, so it was a terrible event on Earth. And we don't have that much data about what happened because obviously you have to piece it together from fossil evidence. So a team at Bristol University working with researchers in Italy developed a huge database on the primitive four-legged animals that are around at the time, their skeletons, their footprints, to see what happened all around the world. And it seems that when it got really, really hot on land, and as you might expect, the mainly reptiles then were able to migrate. So they moved northwards to escape the heat by about 10 to 15 degrees. They were going up into more temperate latitudes. So they managed to survive. Some of them managed to survive. And those were the ones that eventually could come back down into the tropics and thrive there. So they also kept in their more temperate areas. So life did bounce back. Uh, so we did eventually get new forms of life, including the dinosaurs, after this extinction event. But it took a very, very long time, some five million years or more. As you say, it was an incredibly long time ago. So why does it matter now? Well, there's a lot of interest in studying these kinds of events from the past. By understanding what happened, then we can learn more about what's going on in today's world, how things like global warming could affect animal life. Conservation is already talking about a sixth mass extinction underway because of the impact that we're having on plants and animals from climate change and other things like habitat loss. So there's a lot of work going on to see how animals and plants might respond. We already know that there's changing distributions of many species from birds to butterflies. The more we know, then the more we know where to put precious conservation resources. Our science correspondent Helen Briggs. He's one of the most influential guitarists of all time. Eric Clapton rose to fame in the 60s with the Yardbirds, became a global star with Cream and went on to have a distinguished solo career. Now a new film documentary has opened about his life, telling a story of love, pain and addiction. A Life in Twelve Bars also tells of the death of Clapton's son Connor, who fell from a high-rise apartment in New York at the age of only four. Nick Robinson spoke to Clapton about his life, his traumas and, of course, his music. There was a lot of stuff that was being bandied around, which you, you could say was pop music of the time in the 50s, that was banal, you know, it was like music hall. And then the blues and rock and roll came through. What it did was it took me out of myself. And this music was all about hardship and joy, the two things, and hope, you know. I was suddenly exposed at the early age of nine, say, to the, the nature of deceit. My mum, I was raised to think was my sister, and my uncle was my brother. And when the reality that, of that dawned on me, I, I wanted to, I ran away. I, re I really ran away into music. 
and that included particularly the blues. Do you remember the first blues? Well, the first person I heard that it introduced me to that was Chuck Berry. It was a song called Memphis, Tennessee, played on Uncle Mac. But we were pulled apart because her mom did not agree and tore apart our happy home in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, we talked about the pain of childhood. The other big pain that is featured in this film is is the pain of love, the pain of a broken heart, yeah, yeah. of your dedication to the woman who was at the time George Harrison's wife, became yes. your wife, yeah. and produced possibly the most famous Clapton song of them all. It's true, and I don't... But I can't really put my finger on what that was all about because it was about obsession. It was about re recreate or trying to correct something that had happened in my childhood to have the love of a very beautiful woman, which could be my mum. They were sort of, um, they were shifting characters in a way. And That's what gave Layla the power. That gave Layla the power. And it was based, I think, on a lot of stuff that had already happened to me uh, that I wanted to express. When I played it to her in its entirety, and I remember that, she left. <laughs> that was that. It was so, so um, yeah, it was so overpowering. I really did think it would work. I mean, I kind of know now that it probably wasn't meant to anyway. Without the pain, hmm. would there have been the music? Probably not, no. I think the only part that is regrettable, the most regrettable part, is that, uh, that I got drunk. And that's the part, that part is like 20 years of drinking where I, you know, I did really offensive things. I was a nasty person, which I say in the movie, a nasty well, you person. You focus on an incident that you're yeah. often reminded about. Yeah. In which you say you were semi-racist. I mean, you yeah. were racist on stage, yeah, weren't you? Fully, full tilt, yeah. So, I mean, as a simple-minded working class villager like me, there, there was a sort of air of this around the early 70s. And I'm not excusing myself. It was an awful thing to do. The other pain you talk about. Yeah. We've talked about your childhood. We've talked about the pain of love. We can't leave an interview like that without talking about the pain of loss. Yes. Because Tears in Heaven, yes. for so many people across the world, yes. captures what it means to grieve. Yeah, it was what I was trying to do. It was trying to... Um, Heal, I was like, trying to heal myself. And, uh, you know, you talk about it now. We bring it up and I want to cry. Isn't that unbelievable? It's not, it's not done. It's not done and dusted. It's something that is present in my life and always will be. That's the toughest part. That part of the movie is so hard to watch because it's... I had not seen the home footage before of him playing around and... It's de it is tough. It's very tough. Would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? The end of the film, mm. I found myself thinking, how on earth is he still alive? And yes. I don't mean that in a cruel no, no, way. No. Do you ever have those thoughts? And in, in a sense, is that part of the message of the film? You well, got through, I, you made it. I made it um, with the help of some other people. I couldn't do it on my own. And I have a certain amount of pity and compassion for people that are in that place that don't have an element of something that they can hold on to. And I held on to music at the end of my drinking. It was the only thing I had. And I'll tell you something which I don't often say generally is that towards the end of my drinking i thought about suicide all the time and the only reason i didn't kill myself would be that i couldn't drink anymore if i was dead and i don't deserve with what i did and the way i treated my body it's a wonder i am alive but i'm glad i am Eric Clapton talking to Nick Robinson. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, 
You can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. Until next time, goodbye.